Now here's what happens on this cabbage bed, because they're schoolers. When I did that show out of Hayden Lake that night, I actually had a fellow who was out there, he was struggling, was a viewer of mine. I gave him a couple packs of baits, I said, do this. So they set up and said, Seth, can we fish by? I said, fine, well, I don't care. And they caught a bunch of crappies. They in turn went in and cooked me a big steak dinner with potato and the whole deal and brought it out to me, beer and all. I thought, well, this is the greatest thing ever, right? Well, they were just grateful that I helped them. But here was the problem with what they had. They had a boat without an electric motor, so they just kind of float aimlessly. So they were picking up fish here and there. What will happen on these cabbage beds like this, guys, is I'll keep my boat back, say, if that wall is the, the cabbage bed. I'll stay about that far back. I got my drop shot, and I just kind of do an underhand cast. And a lot of times when that thing's dropping down this cabbage wall, because a lot of times, it's just a wall, guys. Cabbage forms a nice wall. That's why they like it. You're not going to find them way up in the cabbage. Don't cast way up in the cabbage. You're going to find them just sitting all around this thing like little soldiers. Kind of just tucked in there. And they're waiting for anything to come cruising in because you'll find the perch and all that stuff and the small bait fish up in here. So they're intercepting them as, the fall, as they're swimming around. Okay, They're ambushing. What you do is you set up like this and you just simply work around with the electric motor like this. All the way around it. I don't care if it's clockwise, kind of, whatever. And you keep going around it. You'll go around it and all of a sudden they'll stop biting. Well, you had a uh, black leech on. Now throw on a green leech or throw on a two inch fish fry black, whatever. Something different. And you go back around. They're not gone, they haven't gone anywhere. Okay, you just keep changing up. Maybe you had something that was white, now it's chartreuse. Okay, and you just keep going through, going around. Once you find them, they're, they're there. You're on the school. Now it's up to you to just continue to change to keep them eating. Now this bite here is going to, the, on the deep cabbage beds, you're going to find them out there all the way until about the whole middle to the end of September. And then they're going to get tough. Okay, then they're going to get tough. And what's happening is off of that break, like this, is they're starting to live more of their time out here suspended. All right. They're still going to come into these cabbage areas off that, right next to that break, but they're going to be harder to find. There's two things that are happening that create that. Well, what's happening? Now the big pike and stuff, they're turning on the gas. Okay, the big bass are turning on the gas. So you have more pressure in here because we've got the deeper weeds are still processing photosynthesis, so they have the oxygen there. It's the same principle when you're out in the center of the bay. Well, that starts to happen now. So what you have to do, instead of fishing on these edges, is you come out, and at this time I would say, go ahead and anchor. Anchor next to that deep weed bed where you knew you were catching them good at. Slip float. Start hooking this way. Come over the top of them like this. If this is 80 feet and you see fish down 20 feet, if you know how to use your graph, set your slip float at 20 feet and float a jig through there. Float a leech through there. Get over the top of them if you want and count out 10 poles. Well, that's 20 feet. I know that's 20 feet. Sit over the top of them and jig them because they're spending more time out here in the open water. Now, what you'll find with crappie is that when the ice comes, all of a sudden things start to pick up and you'll start to catch crappie again. And the bass kind of lay down. The pike will continue to eat. But what you'll find is where that weeds were at here and maybe back in a little further, okay, you'll start to find them pushing up onto these flats a little bit more. Now at first ice, this is something, this is for all ice fishing guys, so keep this in mind, okay. We all know what stratification is when the water stratifies and we set a thermocline in the summertime, okay. Thermocline is 0.5 degree temp change per foot, all right. That is going to be your densest column of water. Finding the thermocline is pretty simple. Put your graft on a high sensitivity. You'll start to see this stuff in here. OK? 
Okay? Small little microorganisms don't have swim bladders. If they have a shell or a skeleton like a dragon larva or whatnot, that keeps them glued to the floor, correct? These little guys up here, be it shrimp or whatever, they get stuck in the densest column of water. So they're just hanging out. You've got three layers in the summertime, an upper, your, your thermocline, and your lower layer. All your oxygen and food sources in this neighborhood right here, okay? Well, when they're suspended out there, what is that, 25 to 30 feet? That's a typical thermocline, good oxygen and whatnot. Now, here's what happens, and this is a whole other hour-long, two-hour-long deal. As the water starts to cool and hits, say, around 49 degrees, this upper layer, and here's our third layer, and here's our bottom layer, this upper layer starts to sink down through. Okay? You hear turnover? What turnover means is now all your oxygen, all your temperature is consistent top to bottom. That's what turnover means. Okay? Now, if you've got something that's 300 feet, it's not going to fully turn over. This is going to settle down to 200 feet, 180 feet, and that's going to be mixed top to bottom. So you're going to have a period of time when Chad and I were out there bass fishing, when it's all equal, that 39 degree range, the bass fishing's good, the oxygen's good throughout the system. They're aggressively feeding. Then as the ice comes, you have what's called inverse stratification. Okay, two layers. When you put your ice cubes into your water, what happens? Floats. Okay. Below 39 degrees, water starts to get lighter to where when it's freezing, it floats, correct? So what happens ice fishing is this. And once again, don't ever think a crappie from this point forward is fishing on the bottom. If you go fishing on the bottom, you're going to catch perch. If you lift it up a little bit, you're going to catch crappie, I promise you. Not that perch won't come up and feed on it, because they'll feed anywhere, but perch low crappie up. Here's what happens. This lower is getting more atmospheric changes to it, this upper layer, correct? Wind, cold wind. Cold air is being exposed to it, correct? Starting to freeze. This lower section down here is the warmest section. Be it five feet off the bottom, 10 feet, whatever. It depends on your depth, okay? This is the inverse. Because in the summertime, what's the warmest part? Your upper? Inverse, reverse. So what happens is your fish get concentrated down here, up off the bottom, five, 10 feet, whatever. If it's this room, look at it, just cut it in half, okay? The atmosphere is having more effect on this upper layer than it is the lower inverse stratification, lower water is warmer. Highest concentration of fish will be down more towards the bottom. I hear you guys all the time, we went, went out on ice fishing, first ice, it was three inches, it was clear, the fishing was great, blah, blah, blah. And then Seth, they just kind of quit biting, all right? They quit biting. Two things occur. The days get shorter, correct? Now they're getting longer. The days get shorter in the wintertime. That shortness of light causes what? Less photoprocessing, correct? Less oxygen. As this ice builds up, coupled with the short days and the snow on top, which makes it even worse, less light is penetrating in. So what happens to all this stuff? What happens to all that stuff? It starts to die and decay. When a, when a phototroph dies, or even at nighttime, it starts to produce carbon dioxide without the light. So when the lights cut down, it starts to decay, it starts to produce carbon dioxide. We don't breathe carbon dioxide, correct? This lower level here now reaches an oxygen level of, you know, may it five, six parts per million, whatever. And now they have to, you hear pH levels all the time? Okay, this is what this is. Now what happens is these fish have to go this way. They're forced up. You guys go out and drill your hole in the ice, and you say, Seth, I was 30 inches up, and I was just killing them, and then I quit. They just quit biting. They should never quit biting. What happens is, is these fish have now moved to here. They're living in this zone, 
You're fishing below them in a non-inhabitable region, so call it, all right? So they're moving up. So now maybe you take, that happens a lot, guys, spear and pike in the, like in Montana and up in, in uh, Canada and some areas where it's prohibited, they cut a six-foot hole in the ice. They drop a decoy down two feet underneath the ice in 10 feet of water. That pike's up here because pike is big, correct? If I go walking up the stairs or I go to Denver where it's less oxygen, I'm going to breathe harder, right? Well, he has to be up as close as he can away from all that because he needs more parts per million in oxygen because he's got more body mass. If they drop it just down below the hole, six foot hole in a dark house with a big old wooden decoy that big painted all crazy, the pike comes in, they gig him in the head. Okay? Well, your perch and stuff, or your crappie, even your perch, perch are going to be a little harder to catch, but your crappie guys, they're right underneath the ice. You may go down two or three feet and that's it. Jigging or something, that's it. They're not down here anymore. That's why ice fishermen struggle so bad. Then as the ice breaks up, like we talked about, what happens, the light gets through, things start to photoprocess again, starts all over again, okay? That's the cycle. Understanding the environment, guys, is the key with anything. Now, like I said, worms, don't use worms. If you want to use maggots, fine. Always try to use some type of a minnow profile. Now, like I said, a big 5 8 ounce spinnerbait, a crappie when he's active, he's going to eat it. All right? What time we got, Chad? I'm going to get into something. 15 minutes left. Okay, I'm going to get into something real quick here, guys, and then we'll have questions. I do this at all my seminars also because a fish is a fish. It doesn't matter if it's a crappie, walleye, a perch, a trout, or whatever. And when I say that, I don't mean they're all alike and they do all the same things. When I say that, I mean they're active 10 to 20% of the day. doesn't matter what the fish is. 10 to 20% of the day, they're active. 80 to 90% of the day, they're inactive. Okay? They'll hit that 5 8 ounce spinnerbait when they're what? Peak activity. Well, we don't have a clock like they do that tells them when to eat. I wish we did. I'd be rich. Okay? So what you have to do by using that drop shot technique, be it with a leech or with a minnow profile, it allows you to fish them slow, force feeds them, keeps them biting. It's not passing them by them real fast. Okay? So now that opens up that window to 100% of the day you can force them to eat. That's why that works so good. So just always remember that. You guys blade bait walleyes like crazy. I know you do, right? You go out and you rip blades. Do they rip blades all day long? Some days, maybe if you're lucky, but what happens? You get a bite and then it slows. Then a good walleye guy picks up his Northland oddball jig head with a goby, hucks it out in that same area, starts dragging it real slow. Slows it down to force them to bite. They're going to hit that ripping blade when they're at peak level, and then they're going to slow down because they've already fed, right? How many of you heard my Thanksgiving dinner speech? I know you guys have. Okay, here it is. You have this big old bait right here, and this is a five inch minnow, and you were catching whatever. You were catching crappie on it. They'll eat it, trust me. I've seen it. And this five inch minnow represents your Thanksgiving dinner. You eat a great big huge dinner. You're full, you're miserable, right? We've all done it. If your wife walks up to you with another Thanksgiving dinner, just after you got done eating Thanksgiving dinner, you're going to look at her and say, you're nuts. I can't eat that. You don't want to eat it, right? Who, who wants to eat it? I look like I could, but I can't. Okay? But when she comes up with that slice of apple pie and that scoop of ice cream on it, what do we all do? We eat it, Right? It's small, it's something different, it's sweet, we like it. Presented to us on our lap, because we're sitting there usually watching the, the lions lose the game or whatever. Okay? Well, this now becomes Thanksgiving dinner. When I'm active and I'll eat a bunch, this now becomes dessert. Same thing as humans. Okay? Downsize it, make it move slower, present it slower, you'll force them to eat. We don't turn down the apple pie. They don't turn down that little tiny bait. OK? 